Thank you, and uh, welcome uh, everybody. So, from the boring topic to a bit more <laughs> the exciting topic, I guess. That's. Um, <coughs> And I'll come back also to the to the boring part, but maybe because I I understood that there are quite a few people here also from from abroad. Maybe first a short introduction of uh, of ABN Amro. Um, we're a Northwest European uh, uh, bank, and in the Netherlands we're truly a universal uh, bank, uh, mainly big in mortgages and also in wealth. Um, and internationally, we focus more on corporate, uh, mid corporates, and and also uh, wealth. For instance, with uh, Neuflise and Bateman in France and, uh, and Germany. Um, in 2018, we really changed our whole <coughs> strategy to a more purpose-led uh, strategy, with also our purpose, banking for better for generations uh, to come. Also, already at that moment, starting to work on, on ESG and, uh, and the like. Now, wh what we then did a couple of years ago was to change um, uh, our strategy a bit, and then we said, and we said, okay, within that purpose, how can we make a difference? And that was by becoming a personal bank in a digital uh, age. And um, our strategy is is focusing on three pillars, or is based on three pillars. The first one is focusing on customer experience. Uh, the second one is on helping our clients to become leaders in sustainability and the sustainability transition. And the third one is the future-proof bank. Now, this is actually the third pillar, is where lots of the stuff uh, is happening, which you basically were presenting, right? So we see that really as the foundational layer uh, within uh, within the bank, and also if you look at the level of attention, there is, uh, I, I think, most attention is currently going also to the third uh, pillar, uh, because we also see that as a basis for data and all the other elements to, for instance, build the, f the number one pillar and also later on the number two pillar on, because data is key for both the customer experience as well as sustainability, as well as the foundation. I'm going actually to talk about uh, something uh, different uh, today, and I could also talk about uh, sustainability or any of the other things, but um, uh, in the preparation we said, why don't we focus on, on digital assets? And for us, digital assets and the what uh, what we do and i will explain that later is very much anchored also within the strategy it's all about creating this new customer experience have a different way uh, to help our clients and the way we do that in terms of our focus segments we mainly focus on mid corporate and uh, large corporates when we uh, work in this uh, in this field um, so what we did, what we did is when we developed our digital asset strategy, we made sure that it fits very well our general corporate uh, strategy we have within the bank. Digital assets is not something new. So um, maybe in very short, I joined the bank in 2018. Before that, uh, I actually worked in artificial intelligence, which obviously is now also super exciting again. Um, and before that, um, I, I worked at uh, McKinsey in banking. Um, but the story here, we already started to work on digital assets before 2018, but in 2018 you first saw uh, some of the more external events we, we had. Uh, we founded, uh, for instance, uh, Vakt & Congo together with many other banks and other institutions. And personally I was quite involved as well on the liver. And, and the common denominator of this first chunk was it was a lot in trade and commodity finance which we at that time still did as a bank at a very, uh, very large uh, scale, which also changed uh, when we did our strategy again in 2019. Uh, and this is also why the digital asset strategy has changed, because we mainly stopped with trade and commodity uh, finance uh, related uh, services uh, in, that, uh, in that year. Maybe still to talk a little bit about that, uh, what I saw, and especially in the context of Deliver, which we did together with Samsung and the Port of Rotterdam, is that it's very powerful to have an end-to-end -end chain with digital documents and actually have control. So it was as much as about getting into control as about making customer impact. And the control was not only for us, it was also for the clients who were actually using it. So in, in very short, we were, uh, we were um, supporting with the blockchain uh, tr uh, container transports out of Rotterdam, for instance, into Singapore or into Seoul. And the clients could, as of day one, track and trace everything. Even on the ship, we used RFID to track everything. Now, what one of the things it did was there was full control about the whole shipping during the whole 
trans tra transport. And one of the big benefits, which we did not see coming, that our clients were, were able, for instance, to bill the delivery really days up to weeks earlier because they had much better information about when actually the goods were arriving. So beyond having, uh, uh, which for us again was less risk if we would have financed uh, some of these uh, transports. So, so what you saw already there is that all the transparency and all the data and having a good data foundation, even in this context, was making a huge difference. Now, obviously we changed our, our, our strategy, uh, much less uh, traded commodity finance. So also we said, doesn't make sense anymore in digital assets to keep focusing on this. Uh, so we transitioned out of the first scope and then more moved into tokenized securities. Uh, we in at first did that together with many other banks. Uh, ING was there also in the lead uh, with Victor, uh, which was done actually in the UK, uh, mainly because of uh, different regulations, was easier there to experiment in a sandbox. Um, and then slowly we moved into our own area where we really started to work on tokenized securities more internally. And, and the way innovation works at, at ABN AMRO is, is that we actually have a separate innovation department, actually strategy and innovation uh, combined, but we don't build the next startups. We already decided years ago, banks are not great in building startups. That's really for <laughs> the outside world, but we still need to innovate just to make sure that we deliver the right products and services to our clients. So that's what we mainly focusing on. That all also means that already in very early stages, we start collaborating with the businesses. So everything around tokenized securities is actually done with our capital markets uh, colleagues. And, and, and they actually um, have also people dedicated, but also in terms of the risk committees and all the other committees, we're actually uh, uh, building on, on their decision mechanisms. Um, just to make sure that it's continuously integrated and that we really get people along uh, the way. That also meant when we did tokenized securities that uh, we started first uh, with an internal bond, just from one ABN AMRO entity to another, be able to track it, etc., and to show that the technology was working. That was experiment number one. Not exciting at all, but just to see is the foundation at work. Then the second, uh, the second step was um, in, in collaboration uh, with uh, SOCGEN and their digital assets union, unit uh, was to actually buy an EIB bond, hold it, and then send it back. And at this moment, we already had integrated the blockchain technology which we were using also with the markets instrument. So uh, basically in Murex, you could see the holding, etc., which was for also our people super revolutionary because they said, oh, but it's an asset like any other asset. We said, yes, it's an asset like any other asset, but it, this built the confidence. Now, and then in 23, I will talk about what we did then, but then we did the first transaction with a real client, but it's on one of the next pages. What you see at the bottom as well, uh, we also invest um, in, in companies in this uh, space, but again, all related more to infrastructure and, 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 and backbones and these type of things. So, so that's a bit uh, what we have done. Now, wh why do we, do we look at this? And although I was making a little bit of a, a, a joke also on, on, the, on the, what the boring stuff and the exciting stuff, um, the, the, the truth is, is that we actually see this also as, in the future, part of the boring stuff. And I'll come back to that. Um, because I I when we look at the world, we see uh, the traditional economy, as I would call it, where people would just come to the bank and the bank would take um, uh, its traditional role, like providing a loan, et cetera, et cetera. And now with the big platforms, uh, like the Amazons of this world, but also the payment platforms who are at more and more services, you see that in this platform economy, the end-to-end -end value chains already get much more distributed. And in some cases, a bank might just do a small part of a service of an end-to-end -end banking service, but still on a central platform. And this is also where now, regulation-wise, there's a lot of pushback. Are those platforms not too powerful? What's happening there, et cetera, et cetera. But still, you see already this intermediation in happening. And you already see that the banking services are still partially traditional, but in this world, already different. What we could foresee in the future is, is much more a 
protocol economy. And in the protocol economy, there might still be something like someone who a company who needs finance, uh, but there are many other parties which will grant certain aspects which are very important in the transaction, but also in confirming that this company is existing and a really, really good company, that actually the assets underlying the transaction exist, that um, they're sufficient on the ESG, etc., etc. Now, those services can obviously in the traditional world were all done by one or two parties or by maybe a conglomerate uh, of banks. Uh, but in this case, it can be in the digital world even further widened. And, and for instance, AB Amor could be the one just saying, okay, this is a great asset. Or we could say, this is actually a client. We know the client, it's a great client. And all these services can be basically decentralized and in on, a, on a singular ledger where you then can check if all the uh, facts are in place. And this just, again, uh, not only for is a completely different way of thinking, um, but also it requires, again, that you banks need to have their stuff in order because it's all about trust and it's each time about reinventing who can we trust, who can actually provide certain services or certain confirmations so that a certain investment or any other thi financial transaction is safe. Um, and this is why we also look at the third uh, column just to learn how it works uh, there and what actually holds us back. Is it at scale? No. Will it be at scale very fast? Don't think so. Is it growing? Uh, absolutely. And what you, we, what you saw lately is that also major banks, especially on the American side, have increased um, their investments in this space dramatically. And obviously, they are quite dominant in this world. Another relevant aspect is that we expect sooner or later there will be also uh, the Capital Markets Union. And the Capital Markets Union will also open up the need for transparency, uh, but also creates smaller companies, also uh, uh, opportunities for, for let's say, mid-corps to also have different ways to finance themselves. But in the current processes and the, the current approaches are way, way too expensive. So also there we need to find ways to automate it and really find uh, other services uh, at a cheaper level with still the same uh, level of reliability and trust. So this is why we looked into it. Now, I will skip this page, but um, um, so, so wh why do we see some benefits in this, in this space? Um, Overall, we see tremendous amount of cost reductions. And these cost reductions are necessary, what I said already previously, is to lower also the prices of the services to make it wider accessible. Um, but what you also see when you start to automate it, it's not only the lower threshold tickets, which you can then enable as well, uh, but the automation makes it faster, can make it more reliable, you can put smart contracts on it, so take the human error out, etc., etc. And, and, and this is why, on the end-to-end -end basis, in the end, it will serve also um, uh, more clients, uh, but also it creates more transparency and more, more trust. And th that's what we actually expect uh, what, will, uh, what will happen. Now, then about 2023. So we actually did our first transaction with uh, our client, uh, APOC. Probably no one knows that client, but they're in... Um, the airplane industry and what they do is they are actually full onto uh, the, the circular part of the aircraft industry. So they basically buy uh, engines or wheels and these type of things, they completely refurbish them and then lease or sell them back. So it's all about uh, reuse. It's, um, um, and they wanted to finance uh, a, a smaller asset um, where they actually wanted uh, us to help them with uh, the tokenization of this. And it was a very exciting, uh, but also still a quite a hard journey. So although we did all the internal stuff, making then the step to a client, again, you need to step up some of the, the, uh, the elements, but also we discovered that some things were just not clear. So uh, I think the biggest challenge in this space is not the technology. Absolutely not. The technology part, I would almost say, it's one of the easiest elements in it. Uh, so we... Um, so we worked uh, with, uh, amongst others, uh, uh, Bitbond. And, uh, and, but, but what you see is, is that the, um, and Fireblocks, but what you see is that it's just all about API integrations and these type of things. The hard part was 
a lot in the legal part. Because in the Netherlands, there's no regulation about can you now actually own a, digi a digital native token, which is actually a bond. In Germany, that's arranged. There's legislation in Germany, but in the Netherlands, there's, there's not. So we had to talk with the regulator. We also had to uh, talk a lot with our internal people. We had external legal advice. Uh, but understanding this and actually getting this right was very important. Also to make sure, for instance, uh, right when you that uh, when um, the tokens were out and people actually were having the bond, uh, that they really were, no matter what the circumstances are, the true owners of it, right? So, and those type of things uh, in terms of legislation were things we really had to take care of to make sure that we did everything correctly. And that was actually most of the work, believe it or not. Um, in the end, we, we managed. Um, 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 but, but still also, uh, we're working now also on new transactions. It's each time, again, a bit of a search on how to do it. Uh, where, for instance, again, if this would have been under German legislation, would have been much less an issue because they already have the laws in place to do this. Now, one of the other things which is also interesting to see is, uh, I got a lot of questions when we went online. Why did you go for Stellar? Why did you go even for an open protocol? Now, for open protocol for us, was just uh, almost a no-brainer because we didn't want to have an extra dependency on a closed network, right? So we we, we believe this is solid, that is very stable, uh, but you have seen what's happening with FTX and all the others. We didn't want to have another party and a reliance on another party in it, again, also from the trust uh, equation. Uh, the other thing is, since this is still early, uh, the protocol gives us flexibility. So uh, the flexibility is, our programmers can actually check a lot of things themselves and also can integrate with it ourselves. We don't need a third party for that. But uh, we might also use a, a different protocol for our next transaction and there's basically no obligation. So also for our learning journey, it was, uh, it was much better. So that's a bit uh, the background on this, um, on this uh, transaction, which was uh, from the company to four private uh, investors. And we will be building up to levels of complexity also with the next uh, transactions. This is, uh, this is actually how it then looked like. But it's also given time wise. Uh, I will not go in too much uh, depth here. Um, but you see uh, different, different rules. And for instance, what I was talking about in the, in the legislations, in the, in the registrar, we can do that ourselves, for instance. But this was where a lot of the legislations uh, was and wh where we need really needed to have to deep dive. Uh, but this is sort of schematic how it uh, looked like. And what you see is uh, with us in the middle, still a lot of external parties, mainly on the technology side. Um, and then again, facilitating the transaction uh, between uh, the issuer and the, uh, and the investments. What did we learn? So if, if you're on, on such a journey, and again, you, right, you want to do this, not in the context of let's do something sexy and then sort of, uh, but really to try to build something which actually uh, we, can we can do more than once, which is a structural, becoming hopefully a structural client service, then, then we have a couple of the recommendations. Now, the first one is to make sure that it's really aligned with the strategy, and you saw and when I gave the historic perspective, that we uh, even changed our approach, when we also changed uh, the, the, the strategy, just to make sure that it's contributing to the heart of the bank. Because obviously these things are always taking longer, or always slightly more expensive, although it's not super expensive. Um, um, so you'll get pushback. And again, then you need to make sure that it's strategically very, very, very relevant. The second one is, is that we didn't go in with the big bang. We had very small experiments from internal to external, and uh, the next one um, will again be somewhat, uh, somewhat bigger and, and, and even more um, uh, changing. Uh, but slowly grow your way in. Why? Because you need to have many of the checks and balances continuously uh, in control. I mean, this is about people's money. This is about people's investment, right? So you need to be very, very diligent uh, to do this. And the third one is that we uh, had a combined teams. And the combined teams were our experts, really on the blockchain, with really the people from capital markets, but also advisors from legal, compliance, etc. The core team was around, um, I think, six to eight people, uh, including the technicians, but we had a circle of 30 people approximately involved to do all the checks and balances to make sure that we were doing the right, uh, the right thing. So, 
that's uh, that's a bit our story around our adventures in digital um, assets. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for for questions. I'm also looking a bit at the organisation, but uh, thanks a lot uh, for listening. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the slide on the token assets, and you said that there was a reasonable reduction of cost up to 65%. What was the time of the measurement of that array? Oh, no, and what are you measuring actually, like in the cost reduction? Uh, it, it's actually a great question. So this is more when you do the studies based on research, that sort of 35 to 65 is the outcome. Uh, we, we're not able to prove that fully our, ourselves yet. So we're not in that phase yet because then you really need to have the end-to-end -end automation with the smart contracts and everything in place. What we do see though is on a couple of elements that uh, some of the things we can do ourselves, we actually can automate instead of having a third party. That's a cost saving already. Um, we see 80, 90% reusage of the legal documentation because with the setup we are having, you can super standardize it. So that's a very big saving as well. And then we could eliminate quite some manual steps, not fully yet because we always take an MVP um, uh, approach. So we still had some manual, for instance, in our operations is still quite manual. Uh, but already for the next one, we have built in some further automations also in the core platforms which Markets is using. So in the end, we think that um, maybe the 65 is too optimistic to be very frank, but we definitely see uh, that it can save significant costs, especially if you are able to crank up the volumes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Hello, uh, thanks ah. Thanks for your, your presentation. So, uh, so you created a, a great product, so tokenized bond. And my question is, how, what are your recommendations to sell it? No? Who, who will be the, 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 the customers paying for it? How do you promote this? How do you um, find uh, clients that trust this and, and pay? Yeah, so so it's it's it, it's very interesting. So uh, basically, the people who are currently selling it are the basically our uh, uh, relationship managers, really in the market uh, space, and especially also in the uh, and then within that, for instance, in the FI space. Um, so it's not our central innovation team which does the selling. We support it. So it's more if people come up with con client conversations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our, our experts. Uh, go with us and, and uh, with, with them. And the reason is that the clients who are mainly interested um, typically already know quite a lot, so they also want to understand if we really know what we're, okay. what we're doing. But it's more from a sales support perspective that my people sometimes join. Um, and then the fees are just the regular fee structures also as, as normal. Um, but then uh, right, we, what we try to do is actually to get the fees lower the more we get it automated. But so fr from, from that perspective, um, uh, most of it we try to treat it actually as with a normal DCM product and these mm -hmm. type of things. And we believe actually that's the way it should be done. Obviously, when you then get into the transaction, right, it, we, all, uh, it's, we always yeah, uh, sell it as maybe the wrong word, but people are aware that it's still a pilot and therefore also has sometimes a bit more back and forwards to really get things done. So our, we're busy also with transactions outside of the Netherlands. Also here we still have some learning to do. So we're very transparent about those uh, aspects. But from the rest, it's, it's like uh, a regular, we, we treat as much as possible as a regular product. 